All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is David, and I'm a librarian here at Moffitt Library. We're joined by Amina at Goshen Library as well. Thank you to Goshen Library for helping to um, co-sponsor this program. We are joined by Oscar Israeliwitz uh, today. He is a architect, a photographer, a uh, tour guide, and a prolific author. Uh, as well as someone who gave personal tours to Leon Uris, the author of Exodus and Tr uh, Trinity uh, during his career. Um, today, Oscar will be um, sharing with us some of the history of the Catskills region, uh, including its many resorts, um, canals, trains, and uh, its architecture. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Oscar, and I will mute myself. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Oscar Israelowitz, and we're going to be discussing the history of the Catskills vis-a-vis uh, -vis its Jewish communities and its uh, synagogues and its grand hotels over the past century or so. And we're going to start in the beginning. Uh, Holland was a world power with colonies in North and South America. There was one colony in Brazil called Recife. In 1654, Portugal captured Brazil and gave its Jewish inhabitants the option of either converting to Christianity, if that is an option, leaving or being killed. This was the Inquisition from Spain and then Portugal from the old world coming to the new world. The, the Jews decided to leave. Some went back to their home port in Amsterdam, Holland in Europe. Others set sail in the Caribbean and founded havens in Willemstad, Curaçao. There are still two Jewish congregations in Willemstad. Others settled in Barbados. That group ultimately ended up in Newport, Rhode Island to found the Turo Synagogue, which is the oldest synagogue building in the United States. One ship during this period wasn't so fortunate. They were attacked on the high seas of the Caribbean by Spanish pirates. Most of their belongings were taken from them and they were dropped off on either St. Martin or St. Eustatius. Most of their belongings were taken from them. Um, the, pardon me, uh, a week or so later, a French ship came along and rescued these Jewish refugees. They went back to the, they wanted to go back rather to the original port in Amsterdam in Europe. The captain of the ship wasn't going anywhere near Amsterdam, but he was going to a place called New Amsterdam, today's New York. A contract was signed by these Jewish refugees that they had to pay the sum of 2,500 gilder, golden guilders, an extremely high price, actually three times the normal fare for this distance for their passage. Upon arrival in New Amsterdam, the 23 Jewish men, women, and children, mostly children, were greeted by the notorious Governor Peter Stuyvesant old peg leg Pete uh, because of his wooden leg. He didn't want Catholics, Quakers, nor Jews in his colonies, especially if they had no money to support themselves. There was a twist of fate. There were two Jewish members of the Dutch West India Company, which owned New Amsterdam in town, Solomon Peterson and Jacob Bar Simon. They stopped Peter Stuyvesant from deporting these Jewish immigrants. They sent word back to Amsterdam, Holland, where many of the shareholders of the Dutch West India Company were Jewish. Pressure was applied and the Jews were permitted to stay on the condition that they would not be a burden on the community. Funds came from other Jewish communities around the world at the time, from uh, Amsterdam, London, and Curaçao. So this was the official beginnings of Jewish of the Jewish community in North America. They arrived before September 7th, 1654. Um, two men were imprisoned and whatever they had left in terms of furniture was sold at auction. Uh, the Jewish New Year in 1654 was on September 12th. The first religious services were conducted that year <clears throat> and the first congregation in America <clears throat> <coughs> excuse me, was organized at that time as well. They were called Congregation She'erit Israel, uh, which means remnant of Israel, because when these 23 Jews arrived without money and they were not welcome, they felt as if they were basically the last surviving Jews on the planet. 
The first congregation again, as I mentioned, was Shevet Israel. Uh, next slide, please. And we're now way upstate, well, away from New York City, uh, near Newburgh, New York. And we're looking at the Gomez House. Louis Gomez was the president of America's oldest congregation shared with Israel. Uh, it was founded, as we mentioned, in 1654. His son, Daniel, built the Gomez House in 1714. It is the oldest Jewish house in colonial America. He purchased 25,000 acres around what is now the city of Newburgh, New York. It was built as a block house and traded furs with the local Algonquin Indians. An apprentice, a young German immigrant named Ashdor, <coughs> excuse me, was hired to help process the furs and pelts that the Indians brought in. He thought that the uh, apprentice was extremely coarse and vulgar with no head for the fur business and soon fired him. That apprentice several years later became the founder of the American Fur Company, America's first monopolist. He later changed his name to John Jacob Astor. Astor was aboard the maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic when it sank in the Atlantic Ocean in 1912 and did not survive. Temple Emanuel of New York purchased the old John Jacob Astor mansion, which was located on Fifth Avenue and 65th Street and built its beautiful temple on the site. The Gomez House, which we see here, is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Next slide, please. Um, I would just want to mention an aside, there was uh, the first Jewish agricultural colony in America was established 11 miles northwest of Ellenville, New York, along Route 55A on the northeast side of the Rondout Reservoir. In 1837, a small group of New York City Jews purchased about 500 acres <coughs> from Edwin Brun, sight unseen. They named their colony Shalom, which means peace in Hebrew. They found barren land, but no peace. Unable to farm due to the rocky soil conditions, they nevertheless cleared the land built roads, erected eight frame houses on stone foundations, set aside a burial ground and built a small synagogue. They tried manufacturing fur caps and goose quill pens, cobbling, tailoring, and peddling used, cloth used clothing they acquired in New York City. Starvation faced them, mortgages were foreclosed. Most returned to the city by 1842. There's absolutely nothing left of their homes uh, nor the synagogue, which was later used as a dance hall by the locals. There is, however, a signpost which reads, which reads rather, Shalom Road. If you look at a AAA map of New York State, there is still a listing for Shalom, New York. Uh, there is an historic memorial plaque honoring this Shalom colony on the lower lobby uh, wall of Congregation Ezra, Ezra Israel in Ellenville. Uh, we'll see that uh, congregation a little bit later. We're now looking <clears throat> at the route of the Delaware and Hudson Canal. Now, this canal, the Delaware and Hudson Canal, was conceived by Maurice and William Wirtz, as in Wirtzboro, who recognized the need for a cheap and efficient fuel to service the industries of New York City during the Industrial Revolution. Until the War of 1812, Bituminous or soft coal was imported from England to New York, but with the advent of the war, that war of 1812, the British cut off the coal supply to America and crisis arose. The Wirtz brothers believed that the anthracite or hard coal of Northern Pennsylvania was the answer to the problem. The Delaware and Hudson Canal was designed by the same engineer who designed the just completed Erie Canal. It ran from Honesdale in Western um, Pennsylvania, which you see there on the left side of this map, all the way along the Hudson, all the way along what is now Route 209 actually, to uh, Kingston, New York, along the Hudson River, all the way on the upper right portion of this map. 
The canal was opened in 1829 and was essentially a one-way route to transport a single commodity, anthracite coal, rather than the general freight in both directions as the, in the Erie Canal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, faith along this DNH canal, DNH standing for Delaware and Hudson. Uh, the Delaware and Hudson Canal was a 108 mile long shipping lane, which started, as we mentioned, in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. There were many Jewish merchants in that town in Honesdale, PA, which served the canal industries. In 1849, a small Jewish community in Honesdale approached the town elders for permission to build a synagogue. They were granted permission to build their house of worship uh, with one stipulation. The structure must resemble all other churches in town. This Jewish church was to conform and have a steeple. The resulting one story wood frame structure does indeed have a steeple, um, but perched proudly above that steeple is a little brass star of David. This is a Bethel congregation they were founded in 1849, and they are still in existence, and they still have worship services. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. This is a romantic view of the DNH Canal, circa, oh gosh, about uh, 1900. The original plan for the canal uh, to be four feet deep, 32 feet wide. The barge was pulled by a team of mules along a towpath, that's spelled T-O-W path, shown here on the right. Um, there was no motor on this barge. The, this view is looking north at the Eastern Correctional Facility for Men at Napanuck, just north of Ellenville. Next slide, please. And that Penitentiary is still there, actually. Uh, the Roebling, okay, we're good. Uh, the Roebling Bridge is the oldest suspension bridge in the United States. It is located above the Delaware River at Mini Sink Ford along Route uh, 97. It was designed in 1848 by John Roebling, who later designed the Brooklyn Bridge. This Roebling Bridge carried the Delaware and Hudson Canal, a trough of water on the lower level of the main span and a towpath for the mules on the upper level of that bridge. Due to the competition from railroads, the DNH Canal went out of business in 1898. The Roebling Bridge is a National Historic Landmark and is run by the National Park Service. Next slide, please. The end of the line of the DNH Canal along the Hudson River was in Kingston, New York. At the north terminus of, DNH, of this DNH canal is the oldest synagogue in Kingston, New York. Temple Emanuel was founded by German merchants. It was organized in 1861 and built its first temple in 1892 on Beale Street near what they call the Strand, uh, if you're familiar with Kingston. When the congregation moved out in 1959, the building was sold to two separate taverns um, and today it is uh, actually renovated as apartments, residential apartments. I think there are seven apartments in this building. So this is a reinvigoration, rejuvenation of this former sim synagogue. So it's now housing. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the easiest way of getting to the Catskills from the latter part of the 19th century was by railroad. The Ontario and Western or O and W Railroad was built in 1884. The main terminal was in Weehawken, New Jersey. So if people from the Lower East Side wanted to get to the Catskills in those days, they would have to first get to the ferry from Manhattan to Weehawken. So they would have to take a ferry. Um, the main line, which is highlighted in black, um, the, the route, the main route traveled north along the Hudson River on the New Jersey side of the Hudson River. Uh, and at Cornwall, it went west to Middletown. At Summitville, there was a major hub. One could take the train south to Port Jervis. Another spur went off to Monticello. And yet another spur went north to Kingston. That route is today part of Route 209, 
which goes to Spring Glen, Ellenville, Accord, King, and Kingston. The main line would continue northwest to Mountaindale, Woodridge, South Fallsburg, Hurleyville, Ferndale, Liberty, Parksville, and Roscoe. The last stop of this main line was Oswego at Lake Ontario. And you can see it way up there on the top of the, uh, on the left side, you see uh, Lake Ontario and Oswego, New York. Next slide, please. Here's a, a closer detail of that switch off at Cornwall, which is the, kind of towards the uh, lower part, of, well, the middle part of this uh, map, and then it's swung over to the left and it's highlighted in very um, dark black. Um, and again, you can see where the spurs were. Uh, in the center, you have Kingston, and then it went down to Summitville and further down to Port Jervis and off to the left to Mount uh, to Monticello. And the, the, main, the main line would be going uh, from Cornwall all the way diagonally up to the left. Uh, next slide, please. Here we see the trains, the old railroads. This was the, uh, the Mountain Express at Young's Gap between Livingston Manor and Liberty. Next, please. Uh, a view of the uh, O&W Railroad scene with a sign advertising the Flagler Hotel and the Nemerson Hotels in South Fallsburg. And these were steam locomotives. These were the old fashioned, uh, the, 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 the heavy horses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a view of the Monticello train station and the train is ready to take off. Uh, the train station itself is still the, the main passenger terminal, uh, that little wood frame building in, on the kind of to the uh, off center to the right uh, is still there. They're owned by an oil company. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, this is a railroad schedule <clears throat> of the O&W main line from New York to Walton, New York. Um, you'll notice on the top, it starts off at Cortland Street. Uh, there's another, uh, they took a ferry from there to Weehawken. Um, the, the next line says West, New, West 42nd Street. Uh, that was the main ferry that uh, it left at 755 uh, from Manhattan and it got to Weehawken at 745. Uh, and then it left at 810 from Weehawken and went all the way up to Cornwall and arrived there about 940. Um, then you go to the middle section um, and it says Middletown arrived there at 1030 a.m. Um, and I'm missing, I have a little blockage here. It says this meeting is being recorded. Uh, I'm just gonna work around there. But if you keep on going down, you scroll down, if you will, um, you see Mountaindale and with the, um, well, you have like a, a, you would have to take a, um, a shuttle, uh, a wagon, a horse and buggy for, to Dairyland or Greenfield Park. And at Woodridge, uh, you can, it would, it would arrive there at 1138. So you're leaving New York at 755 and you're getting to Woodridge at 1138. Okay. Um, and then you can have a spur. Uh, at Woodridge for Glenwild and Dairyland. And at Fallsburg, um, you would have to catch a shuttle um, to Kaimisha Lake, Monticello, Sackett Lake, South Fallsburg, and Woodburn. Uh, ultimate, oh, and Luzon, by the way, is another name for Mountaindale. Okay. Um, hold on one minute. No, that's, uh, yeah, okay. That, that would be like, um, Hurleyville, you would have a spur for Hurleyville, Lock Child Rake, and Divine Corners at Ferndale, uh, a spur for Swan Lake. And now we're talking, if you want to get to Roscoe, way down at the bottom, you would arrive there at 12.55. Um, that would be p.m. All right. So we're leaving at 7.55 a.m. and getting to Roscoe at 12. So it was a journey. It was a schlep. Uh, <laughs> now let's go to the next slides, please. This is the um, Ellenville Terminal. Um, and you see in the background, the Shawangunk or Shongunk Mountains as the local Indians would call them. Um, 
the uh, ice cave mountains are way up there along Route 52. But you'll notice this is a very early view, <clears throat> about 1890 or so. There is no electrical motor car. It's all horse and buggy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, South Fallsburg Station is still there. It doesn't look this way anymore, <clears throat> but the, the overall shape you can determine, there are no arches. Uh, so this was more or less of a Spanish style. And also the, the Catskill region from the 1920s or thereabouts, uh, the, the, a lot of the hotels use the, um, the Spanish style. They use Spanish uh, roofs and the Alamo frame uh, buildings. We'll see some of those a little bit later. But this building is now used as the courthouse uh, of South Fallsburg. And I remember that because I went to that courthouse because I, I made a wrong turn. Uh, yeah, you probably know the story already. <laughs> Keep on going. Next, please. Uh, the O W Railroad trestle crossing the Mongup River at Ferndale, New York. Now, there's a that was a gorgeous trestle. Um, it was taken down in the mid-1950s. Uh, all that's left of this trestle is, is the concrete support, um, the foundations of these. There were four of them. And as you go, there's like a, a yeah. it was near uh, Ferndale Antiques. OK, if anyone's familiar with the region from way back, I think they closed down a couple of years ago, uh, the owner passed away, it was very sad. Uh, but those foundation stones are still there. Uh, the trestle and the, the bridge itself, uh, the steel frame is all gone. Now, the, what happened was with these railroads, coming from New York State, let's say from Liberty, they would bring dairy goods, fresh dairy goods, such as butter, milk, cheese, eggs, and they would have what they call creameries, which were like buildings which would maintain their, their, the, the coldness of these products so they would be fresh and they would have ice buckets um, inside the, the freight part of this train and going south towards the city, they would, it would basically, basically be a freight train. Uh, on the reverse end of this, and these trains would end up in Weehawken, New Jersey, and then take the ferry across and deliver the goods to the stores in New York. On the reverse journey going northbound, going towards the Catskills from New York, it would become a passenger service. So we mentioned before we saw the, the, the railroad schedule that it took four to five hours to get from Weehawken to Roscoe, um, and it was a journey. Uh, but this is the procedure. This was so it was a two way, as you mentioned before, with the uh, Dean H Canal. It was only coal going the into the uh, Hudson River direction, the southbound direction, direction or well, southeast. Um, and there was nothing, they would have empty barges going back to Pennsylvania. Um, but on the railroad, you would have it used in both directions. Next slide, please. And here's another view of the same trestle. Uh, and you see the old stone arches uh, of Ferndale. Next slide, please. And actually the Ferndale station uh, is still there. It's also used by an oil company. We're looking at the Liberty station uh, with lots of people. This is a colorized postcard from about 1900 or so. Uh, you notice the way people are dressed. Uh, um, old. Um, and this building uh, later became, when they closed the railroad, it, it was abandoned for a while, then it became a very popular restaurant. Uh, what I do remember that halfway up the hill, there was Katz's Bakery uh, of Liberty. Then they moved downtown to Main Street or Broadway. Uh, that was the best bakery in town. Anyway, moving right along. Next, please. Now, we mentioned the Spanish style. You'll notice the Spanish style. This one now in uh, Bloomingburg or Bloomington, or whichever. It's like near, it's on the upper part of the um, uh, Shawanga Mountains before you go down into the valley into Wurtsboro. Um, now, there's stories about that, that, that trip going through that valley uh, to Wurtsboro. Um, I used to go to the bungalow colonies every summer from when I was a child 
and they would be something called a hacker, which was like a, a, a taxi service, um, like an Uber today, where you have different people coming on board, but they would take all the, all the luggage, if you will, from New York or from Brooklyn, from whatever part of the city you were coming from, and they would schlep you and a few other families in this stretched limousine of sorts with all the luggage on top, and they would get to Wurzburg. Going down the hill was not the problem. Going up to the other side of the hill was the major problem, and a lot of these cars didn't make it. Uh, I don't know if there are any left on the way there from 40, 50 years ago. Um, who knows? Maybe they are. Okay, but anyway, so this used to be the railroad station of Bloomingburg, I believe it's called, and um, it's now been expanded. They built an upper floor. It was basically the arched area. That was the, the station itself. It was fairly small, and a private uh, gentleman um, added a whole second floor and, and built it up, and it's very... Um, uh, it, it, it feels like it's a, a part of the Ontario and, and Western Railroad, but it's beautiful. And it was on for sale about two years ago. Uh, you actually may look it up online, possibly. Uh, the interior views, it was gorgeous. And the selling price about two, three years ago was $675,000 for this one family house uh, in this remote town in the middle of nowhere, but it's beautiful. Uh, moving right along, next please. Uh, we're going to speak a little bit about uh, the Jewish farmers, and in Yiddish it says Der Yiddische Farmer. Um, <clears throat> now, there were German Jewish philanthropists such as Baron Maurice de Hirsch, <clears throat> who wanted to get <clears throat> masses of Jewish immigrants coming from Eastern Europe around the turn of the 20th century away from the teeming Lower East Side tenements and bring them out to the countryside and to the Catskills, amongst other places. Also, they brought them out to New Jersey. Uh, Southern New Jersey had thousands of uh, farms um, and also way out west in the Dakotas, they brought them down to Argentina. They have what they call the Jewish gauchos. There's a whole study of them that not many left um, in, uh, I think it was Northern Argentina, and, um, and also in Canada, by, uh, in Saskatchewan. And um, there was a place called Edinburgh, um, and the, the locals, the Jewish people, called it Edinburgh, as in Yiddish-speaking people. Um, so anyway, the plan was to bring these immigrants coming from Russia, from Eastern Europe, from Poland, and who had no training in farming and bring them out to these areas and um, train them and teach them how to become farmers. Uh, most of them couldn't really handle it. The, the land wasn't you know, fertile enough to, to grow things. So ultimately they became dairy farmers. So they would have, you know, they have cows, they have chickens, they became chicken farmers. Uh, next slide, please. And here we're going to see some of the um, interesting people. This was Mr. Cohen. Um, hold on one second. Let me get all the names correct. Uh, da, 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 da. That's Mr. Cohen with his prized horses. Okay, next. And this is the Gottlieb family. I love that boy with his shorts. I call this American Jewish Gothic. Uh, maybe. Um, next, please. And then there was something called the Cooperative Fire Insurance Company of Sullivan and adjoining counties. And they were based in Woodridge. The building is still there. They're still active. And what it was basically, <clears throat> it was a um, a co-op co where people would own the shares. Now, these people only spoke Yiddish and they could not get fire insurance for their farms, for their buildings uh, and for their property. So they organized this cooperative insurance company and they had a few people who did speak English and they went up to Albany and they got incorporated 
And uh, they served between 1913 and 1948, but uh, the building is still there. And this is part of a calendar. Uh, you notice some of the names on the left. Um, it says, what's his name? Did Abraham Gibber, Kaimisha Lake. There was a Gibber's Hotel. Abe Jaffe of Glenwire. We're gonna see a picture of him. Um, let's see who else. Uh, do, 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 do. On, the, on the right side, we have Solomon D. Siegel of Swan Lake. He built up Swan Lake, and we're going to see some of his hotels that he built. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this was Abe Jaffe. Um, he was born in 1909 in Glenwild. His father was a farmer and founded the Glen Wild Synagogue. He attended Monticello High School and New York University Night School. During the day, he worked as a cutter of ladies' undergarments. He returned to Glen Wild when the Great Depression started. There was plenty of work on the farm. In Manhattan and New York City, there was no work. Everybody was unemployed. But on the farm, there was a lot of work. The animals had to be tended. So while he was in the city in Lower East Side, he told his coworkers about living on the farm with all of its fresh products. There was fresh milk, fresh eggs, fresh vegetables, and the air was clear and cool and fresh as well. Uh, this attracted many people to come visit his farm in the summertime. Uh, Abe Jaffe, seen on the left. Uh, next slide, please. He was on the left of that picture. And then he built a few bungalows. The, on the right side is the main house, all right? Um, and on the left side are the bungalows. Now let's talk about that main house. Um, there was something called a koch alayim, which means do-it-yourself cooking, which means that he rented rooms upstairs in his farmhouse to boarders, and they would share the kitchen, and they would have one or two refrigerators, and each person would have a space in the refrigerator with the name of the family and they would take their fresh produce and they would cook, they would make breakfast and lunch and dinner and they would cook by themselves. So it's like being at home and yet being in a hotel. So this was called a Koch Alain. So the buildings uh, started like that It evolved, these Koch Alains evolved into the hotel industry of the Catskills. Uh, later on, they built bungalows, which would be rented out. So the, the like would have two, sometimes three rooms, and you would have entire families spending the whole summer in these little bungalows, and they would not have any heat. So I remember August 15th, it gets very, very cold in the Catskills, and you had to turn on the oven to keep warm. Uh, next slide, please. Next, please, yeah. Um, so we mentioned the Kachalines, which evolved into the hotel industries. Um, but there was something beyond that. We're going to be talking about a magic kingdom. Imagine a hilltop kingdom with a royal family, royal advisors, court jesters, and musicians, and many foreign dignitaries, as well as common folk, visiting this magic place on a daily basis. You might think, that this place was perhaps Monaco or Liechtenstein. Uh, this place was actually a grand hotel in the Catskills near a village called Ferndale. It was Grossinger's Hotel. It all started in 1914 when Zelig and Malka Grossingers, here Zelig Grossingers, restaurateurs in New York City purchased a 50 acre farm in Ferndale. The soil was not good for growing anything worthwhile, so they rented out part of their nine-room farmhouse to boarders. They later purchased the 800-acre Nichols Farm on top of a mountain, which later became the site of Grossinger's Hotel. <clears throat> their daughter, Jenny Grossinger's, <clears throat> Grossinger rather, served as the gracious hostess for all of the guests, whether they be kings and queens or just simple folks from Brownsville, Brooklyn up for a week's vacation. She would go from table to table during dinner uh, in the grand dining room and ask if everything was all right. Uh, she was just like your mother. Now you can also order, I remember I used to go to grocery many, many years ago. You can order five main courses and nobody will say anything and that's all for the same price. 
It was a year-round facility, which is, was a first in the Catskills. Most of them were just for the summer, but Grossinger's turned out to be a, a all year long uh, um, uh, location. And it was almost like an independent country. <clears throat> it had its own post office, <clears throat> it had its own zip code, a private airport would fly in special guests and performers, its own printing plant and its own synagogue with a full-time rabbi. It also had ski slopes, a lake, and 18-hole golf course. <clears throat> Grossinger's went under um, basically mismanagement over the years, more recent years, and the buildings were abandoned. They, they sold off at auction all of the, uh, the dishes and, and the, whatever you can like, the lighting fixtures. And we're going to see a little bit more of Grossinger's. Let's continue. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so it was a little village. It was a beautiful, this like a Tudor style um, hotel rooms are up there. Next, please. Again, we mentioned they had an outdoor pool for the summer and an indoor Olympic sized pool for the winter. Next, please. And they would have the, the greatest entertainers, Bob Hope in the center. Next, please. Jack Benny playing golf. You see his golf club on the right. Next, please. And Will Chamberlain was not at Grossinger's. He was at Kutcher's Hotel. Uh, he was, oh, I guess, almost seven feet tall. Um, and he basically was the uh, a bellhop. And uh, he would take, you know, your luggage in. And But he also played basketball for the Kutcher's uh, basketball team. And he won a lot. Next, please. Um, this is the Concord Hotel. Well, let's back, I'm gonna, no, I'm not gonna back, I'm gonna talk about that the hotels in the Catskills served as basic training camps for hundreds of young entertainers who later made it to Hollywood. Eddie Fisher got his start singing at Grossinger's. He married his first wife, Debbie Reynolds, in Grossinger's Hotel. Their daughter, their daughter, Carrie Fisher, starred in the movie Star Wars. Neil Sedaka played accordion at the pool of Esther Manor. Will Chamberlain worked as a, a bellhop at Kutcher's in the 1950s and then played basketball at night. Sid Caesar played saxophone at the Avon Lodge. Robert Merrill, his original name was Merrill Miller, started singing and worked as a straight man for comedy routines at the Young Gap Ho Young's Gap Hotel. Uh, Malzi Lawrence started out as a social director at the Sunrise Manor. Marvin Scott, who's on Channel 11 News at night at 10 o'clock sometimes, lived in the Mars Heights section of the Bronx. He was a bellhop at the Raleigh Hotel, which is still active. Surprisingly, there were 1,500 hotels. 98% of them are gone. The Raleigh Hotel is still around. It's owned by Hasidim. Uh, his name, well, Marvin Scott's, um, I guess, born name uh, was Marvin Oppenberg. He is still a regular newscaster on WPIX Channel 11 News. Uh, some of the entertainers appearing at the Concord Hotel included Buddy Hackett, Tony Bennett, and Barbara Streisand. Okay, now we're looking at the Concord Hotel original building. Many of the large hotels in the Catskills, such as Grossinger's, Kutcher's, Tamarack Lodge, and the Neville, started as Jewish farms, which had to supplement their incomes by taking in summer boarders. The Concord Hotel did not follow that pattern. Arthur Winterick was a self-made millionaire. He invented a hair tonic called Jerus. In 1935, he foreclosed on a mortgage he held on the Concord Plaza Hotel in Kaimisha Lake. In 1939, he incorporated the properties around the lake as the Concord Hotel. <clears throat> There's a story that Arthur Winterick was once turned away from Grossinger's Hotel because it was full to capacity. He was so angry that he decided to build the biggest hotel in the Catskills and take all of the guests away from all the other hotels. When his first hotel burned down in the 1940s, he built the first concrete and steel hotel in the Catskills. When, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, that's the interior, uh, the uh, 
the entertainment space. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll, we'll hold off on that. Uh, when the 1939 World's Fair closed, he purchased many ornaments from demolished exhibit buildings. He turned his hotel into a palace. It was designed by noted architect Morris Lapidus, who also designed the Fountain Glow Hotel and the Eden Rock Hotel in Miami Beach. The Concord Hotel was designed for young and upscale people. Rosinger's offered an 18-hole 18 an 18 golf course. The Concord had to outdo Rosinger's by offering the monster golf course with 45 holes. <clears throat> now, this staircase in the Concord Hotel lobby is the staircase to no place, to nowhere. It was designed by Morris Lapidus, as we mentioned a moment ago, and he incorporated beautiful paintings, uh, <clears throat> and the people are dressed very, very properly, very, very ritzy, if you will. But each of these staircases, and they have the same concept in the Fountain Blue Hotel. Staircase goes up, you come in with your cape, your stole, your elegant outer garment, you go up the stairs, there is a coat room up there, nothing else. And you give in your cape, your stole, your mink, whatever, and you come down and you march down the grand staircase like the queen of Sheba. And it's like la di da, I've made it, um, it. And it's just for show. This staircase is just for show. Next slide, please. <laughs> So here we see the two towers, the twin towers, if you will. Uh, I think they were 12 stories each, uh, concrete and steel. <clears throat> now, this complex, the Concord Hotel went under, went bankrupt, but before they completely um, sold off or imploded actually the buildings, they were used these towers were used as a training facility for firefighters from all over the United States. Since the buildings were designed with concrete and steel reinforcement, that meant that fires could be set at various locations and serve as a high rise fire prevention session. Um, the buildings were really fireproof. So when you had the fire, you just put it out and there was no real damage. Um, so ultimately the hotel was imploded and uh, there's now a uh, casino gambling resorts, um, I believe it's called, they not on the exact site and they built a water park, the whole big thing. I don't know how well they're doing, but the old Concord Hotel is no more. Now we're gonna see some minor hotels in the Catskills. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this was the Lakeshore House of Lake Huntington, New York, uh, circa 1900. Next, please. Uh, the whole house. Now you'll notice, uh, well, I can't really read all of this stuff because I have this image in the center of my picture, uh, but at the bottom, uh, it says for one room, it was $8 to $12, two rooms was $16 to 20, but it says in bold letters, no Hebrews or consumptives taken, um, which means no Jews allowed, and consumptives was con tuberculosis, I guess, which they assumed that all Jewish people had. So it was blatant. This was an advertisement in the o w Railroad. They gave out brochures for the, uh, for the trips going up to the Catskills. And there were advertisements for these hotels and they would be blatant. They would say, uh, or the hotel would say, we are close to all churches, all churches that are nearby. Uh, so that means that Jews are not welcome. Uh, next slide, please. But on the other hand, we have advertisements for other hotels which were Jew Jewish oriented. This was the Neverly Hotel and Country Club. This was the original building. Nowadays, you have that round uh, tower um, and they keep on saying, we're gonna rebuild, we're gonna open and nothing happens. Uh, the Neverly Hotel was named um, after the, uh, well, Mr. Who was that again? Hold on one second. Do, 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 do. Yes, it was founded by the Slutsky brothers uh, in Ellenville. Uh, some say that there were 11 Slutsky children. And you take the word 11 and reverse it, you get the 
the Neville Hotel, all right? And others say it was like a group of teachers, there were 11 teachers, all kinds of theories about that. Uh, so the Slutskys built up the town of Ellenville. Um, adjoining to the Neville Hotel on the north side was the Falls View Hotel. So the Neville Hotel was never really kosher uh, as such, but the Falls View Hotel, which was just next door, was always kosher. Um, and the Falls View Hotel later became Honors Haven, which became uh, Passover kosher. And now it's only um, Honors Haven, no longer kosher. Uh, next slide, please. Now, okay, so we're talking about the opposite of the advertisements for the you know, anti-Semitic um, shtick, if you will. This was a Shawanga Lodge advertisement. You go, you look down on the bottom, it says somewhere, here we go, um, maybe an inch up, it says a mountain paradise only 66 miles from George Washington Bridge, refined Jewish clientele. That says it, but they offer everything, they have concerts, entertainment, and 250-acre beautiful grounds, uh, unexcelled cuisine, indoor gym, saddle horses, solarium, ping pong, everything. Uh, next, please. The Pineview Hotel. Ah, I went there. Uh, in Fallsburg was one of the grand hotels catering to modern Orthodox Jews. Uh, this was their early building. They uh, tore this down and uh, built a newer one. Uh, it was later taken over by the town of Fallsburg by eminent domain. That means they needed the property. Why? Because the town demolished this hotel and built a maximum security prison, the Sullivan Correctional Facility, the jail. David, not the one in in, uh, in Fallsburg, because that's the um, that's a minimum. The one with the with the uh, they sound at twelve o'clock midday. They sound the sirens going off. Uh, that the one in the field and the, all the cornfields around. Anyway, so that's a separate one. But this was maximum security, and there was a guy by the name of David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, one of the most notorious prisoners he I don't know if you remember him when they when he was killing people like they were parked in lover's lane and they just killed people like scary stuff so anyway so he's Loki he's still there uh he, he was Jewish and then he's he converted to Christianity and uh, so this is all part of and parcel of the Pineview Hotel uh next please <clears throat> Tamarack Lodge <clears throat> Greenfield Park was going to become a casino gambling hotel in more recent years, but a disgruntled Indian worker burnt the entire hotel and its adjoining, adjoining Bungalow County to the ground. And it was owned by the, uh, I think, Max Levinson and son. Yeah. Next, please. And there's the Pioneer Hotel Country Club. Um, that's the hotel over there on the, uh, the left photo, all the way over on the left side. And you'll notice the arches, that's the uh, Alamo style, uh, the Spanish motif um, of architecture, which was dominant uh, in the 1920s and 30s throughout the Catskills. Uh, this is no longer in existence. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, I believe there are about 44 signs. Um, the only one that's not related to hotel is the uh, boot off indoor or outdoor furniture sign on the left side. But you have all these hotels. You've got Saxonies and, and everything under the sun. A lot of, a lot of hotels. Pine View, again. Um, next, please. Well, actually, that sign was um, on Route 17 near Monticello. We're now at the Brown, looking at a postcard for the Browns Hotel, Charles and Lil Lillian Browns. Uh, and they say that Jerry Lewis was, uh, they called it Jerry Lewis's Browns Hotel. Uh, next, please. A view of Central Broadway business section of Monticello, New York. It looks almost like Times Square. Uh, this was during the summer and it was like gridlock, my goodness. But this is 1920s and 30s. Uh, nowadays, it's a ghost town. It's kind of spooky. Next slide, please. Uh, and how do you get to the Catskills for many, many people was the short line buses. Uh, this is a view at one of the terminals at the Dixie Hotel Dixie in at 42nd Street in Manhattan. Now it's, uh, it would be at the um, 
Port Authority bus terminal. Okay, next please. Uh, we're now looking at some of the synagogues. This was the uh, synagogue, of, the original synagogue of Ellenville built in 1909. Uh, Ezra of Israel. Um, this is along Route 52. Um, the congregation is now across the street. Next slide, please. Okay, we're now in Mountaindale. Um, so I'm, I'm corrected. Mountaindale was once called Luzon. Okay. Um, so now this was the first synagogue of Mountaindale. No, I'm wrong. Corrected. This is Woodridge. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, this first synagogue was founded around 1900 by local kosher butchers. So this was the butcher synagogue. There was as many as 1,500 kosher hotels in Sullivan County at one point. Uh, they needed kosher ritual slaughterers or shochtim um, for the food. Uh, here's a view of the exterior of that building. And next slide, please. And here's the interior. Uh, you'll notice the ark. Okay. Now, that ark is still there. This is an early view. Look at that lamp. It looks like it's a gas lit lamp. Um, next slide, please. Same ark, present day image. Um, there is a small building directly across the street from the present day synagogue in Woodridge. Uh, and this is the, they use the, the, in the winter when it's too cold to heat up the entire synagogue across the street. So they use a small building at one point, they'd probably change it now, but they use this as their, their daily chapel. And they have a minion here, 30, 360 days a year. I don't know how they do it, how they manage it, but somehow they manage. And, but this was the original log from the 1900 synagogue building. Next slide, please. And this is the present day uh, exterior of the Mountaindale, of the uh, rather Woodridge synagogue. Um, now, what happened was with that first synagogue, with the butcher's synagogue, there was a fight. There's always a fight in the synagogue. It's not a synagogue if you don't have at least one fight a day or a week or a month, whatever. There's always a fight. And they said, we're going to move away the, the other side, group A versus group B. So group B says, we're moving away. So they bought land right next door to the right of the first synagogue, one foot away, and built this beautiful brick building, uh, almost like a city synagogue. And the original 1900 building is no longer there. And the ark is still there across the street. And let's go inside this building. This is a National Historic Landmark Synagogue. Look at this. We're talking about crystal chandeliers, stained glass windows, murals on the walls. And this is like from in a farming community, but this was a wealthy congregation because you had butchers, you had lots and lots of butchers. Um, and let's take a closer look at one of those murals. Next slide, please, on the wall. So this a scene, a depiction, uh, it could be Palestine from 1930 or so. Uh, again, it looks like it's like a art modern style um, architecture. Next slide, please. We're now in, this is Mountaindale actually, uh, and the synagogue is on the right and the small building on the left is the ritual bathhouse, the mikveh. Uh, this is also an historic landmark building, a national historic landmark. Next, please. We're now in Wordsboro. There's a synagogue and just go off the main street. I think it's called the Canal Town Emporium. Uh, just two blocks away, you have this, this little synagogue. Uh, beautiful white stucco. Again, the style of architecture is the Alamo style or the Hacienda or the Spanish style architecture. Next, please. Uh, again, the, the style is similar, but this is now in Bethel, New York. Um, it's midway between Swan Lake and White Lake in the middle of farm country, fields and fields and fields. And all of a sudden you come across this little synagogue and you'll notice there's a window uh, upstairs. That's the women's balcony for like 10 women, maybe 10 women can sit up there and dances. They only use this next week. They use it for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur for the high holidays. That's it, the whole year they don't use it. 
but only during the high holy days. And this is also a historic landmark. Next, please. Uh, we're now in Hunter, New York. This, some people call this the real Catskills, where you have these very huge uh, mountains. It, it, some people call it the, uh, the Switzerland. Uh, the Fleischmanns is nearby. Tannersville is nearby. Uh, so they're very, very high. There's a lot of skiing there in the winter. Um, this is an early rendering uh, of that synagogue. The building is still there, but they took away those twin towers. Um, next, please. Okay, we're going to be ending up the program in a few minutes. This is the waterfall in Stevensville, New York. Now, what is Stevensville? We mentioned the name. Um, there was a Mr. Stevens, and he owned the town, called it Stevensville. Uh, it later changed to Swan Lake. So this is the waterfall. The lake is beyond and back. Uh, high up, 10, 20 feet up. And then you have this waterfall. And below, years ago, there would be a, a mill and they would have these grist, the, the, they would grind flour to, 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 to be used to bake matzahs and bread. Um, so this was a, a major industry. Um, and this waterfall, if you go to Swan Lake today, it's still there. Next, please. Uh, this was the Stevensville Lake Hotel. Next, please. This was the presidential, uh, the President Hotel, actually, uh, named after, I think it was President Roosevelt. They say was there. I kind of uh, doubt it, but they can say a lot of things. But you notice in the, on the bottom, these little pine trees, if you go to the location, this is like uh, in Swan Lake, the town, if there is such a thing as a town, uh, they're like three stores. Uh, that's the town. Um, but these pine trees are now 100 feet tall. This, like, this is like when they just opened the hotel. And this hotel is gone, it's demolished, but they do have something, they have a condominium called um, Presidential uh, Estates. And it's a modern Orthodox group. And the, the synagogue has been there since like 1920. And they use the synagogue right across the street from the hotel, well, the, the uh, estates. And uh, it's an ongoing process, a beautiful neighborhood. Next, please. And this is our last slide. We're looking at what they call coaching day. Um, they would have a coach, whether it be a motorized coach or a horse-drawn carriage, uh, which was a coach also. Uh, and they would decorate them on major holidays, Memorial Day, 4th of July. And all the women, women would, be get, would get dressed up in white and they would parade up Broadway and Main Streets and it was happening. So this is my version of Welcome Back to the Catskills. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I love to take questions uh, and we'll take it from there. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording now so people should feel comfortable to uh, turn their 